airports are some of the most visited and, at the same time, mysterious places out there. So, let's see what's going on behind the scenes and what secrets airports hide. At some airports, there are special people called profilers. Such people bring to life a special program called SPOT, Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They analyze your mimics, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice nonverbal signs of anxiety, people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in an unusual way, they can invite them for an inspection. There, they talk to this person trying to find out more about them and confirm, or not, their suspicions. Airport agents might also be watching you all the way from the security check to your gate. Some airports have facial recognition scanners that can easily track you. They're equipped with special software that compares passengers' faces with their IDs. Keep in mind that if you don't charge your laptop before the flight, it may be confiscated. It's not uncommon for an airport security officer to ask you to power your device up. If you fail to do it, your gadget can be taken away for an additional check. For safety reasons, it's crucial to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with or modified in a way that can cause harm during the flight. Packing an electric brush in your check-in luggage may land you in trouble. Brushes produced by some brands have lithium batteries inside, and those can potentially lead to serious problems in the air. That's why leaving your electric brush in your check suitcase isn't an option. But you're allowed to store them in your carry-on bag. At the same time, if your device runs on AA batteries, you can put it wherever you want. Anyone who's ever traveled by plane knows about the no liquids rule, but not everybody knows that this rule also applies to peanut butter, toothpaste, creams, lotions, liquid makeup, lava lamps, snow globes, some kinds of medications, deodorant, and even gel shoe inserts. Now, let's go outside for a while and look at those landing spots. Airports charge airline companies huge fees for landing on their runways on certain days and at particular times. But the most interesting thing is that the landing spots can be bought and sold. For example, in 2016, Oman Air paid Air France around $75 million for one early morning arrival slot at London Heathrow Airport. You must have noticed that airfare has increased over the past decade. That's because of the extremely high prices of landing slots. Dispatchers don't only control the planes in the sky, as you can often see in the movies, but they also look after their movements on the ground. They also control the lighting on the runways. There's three types of air traffic controllers, en route, terminal, and tower. Each of these dispatchers has their own area of responsibility. One dispatcher has about five monitors, and the information on them is constantly changing since the monitors show weather conditions and information about other planes. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to a security checkpoint, and all of a sudden, it turns out you have something prohibited in your carry-on. But worry not, you still have a chance to save your favorite pen knife. At some airports, there are on-site postal services, and you might have an opportunity to mail your belongings to any address you provide. But the mailing fees are pretty high. Plus, certain items are prohibited, and the postal service won't deliver them. Airports can be selling your lost luggage right now. Of course, I don't say that there's no chance for you to get back your suitcases that's traveled to a different destination, but just as likely, you might not see it again. In this case, an airport has the right to sell your misplaced belongings at an auction. Most airports have an annual lost luggage sale. After paying an entry fee, you can bid on electronics, clothes, bags, and other stuff. While flying, you might have a celebrity on board, but you won't know it. Large airports have separate check-in and security procedures for celebrities. They often board the plane directly through a hidden door located beside the jet bridge. Some airlines also use cool cars to transfer VIP passengers from the terminal building to the plane. At the same time, most people come to the airport well ahead of time. And the most popular activity while waiting for a flight is wandering through the duty-free zone. 
And even though people rarely plan to buy anything there, different products end up in their shopping baskets. That's because lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes people feel relaxed and at ease. I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light, massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. Designers put a lot of thought into airport layouts. It helps to ensure the smooth flow of travelers. And the main point here is easy navigation that can prevent people from getting lost. This is achieved through subtle but very effective design cues. And placing duty-free zones between security checkpoints and boarding gates is one of them. They supposedly help you relax after clearing security and lead you where you need to go. But speaking of food, a celebrity chef restaurant at the airport might not be as good as it would be if you were visiting the real thing. Not chefs themselves, but special restaurant companies are responsible for airport outlets. One of the reasons is the extremely strict security that surrounds airport deliveries, including food. You may still have a nice meal, but it won't be the same. Now, I'll tell you about one more way airports manipulate you into spending your money. They make you walk through the shiny duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look to the right while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are more likely to look. Oh, and have you ever noticed how many mirrors there are at airports? Mirrors are strategically placed there to make airports appear larger and create an illusion of more space. This in turn helps to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia and makes the airport experience more comfortable for travelers. If you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who didn't buy local currency in advance can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. Some services only need a few hours' notice for such an order, or it might even be better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, have you ever paid attention to airport codes? The most often used are three-letter codes. Why this number? Back in the 1930s in the USA, pilots used the National Weather Service's two-letter city codes to refer to airports. But soon, the number of airports in the country outgrew the number of such codes. That's why airlines expanded this system by adding the third letter. It was usually X. That's how LA, Los Angeles, turned into LAX. But even though there shouldn't be two airports with the same code, some of these codes sound so similar you could easily mistake one for the other. For example, look at this airport with the code CGP in Bangladesh. And here we have CPG. It's the code of an airport in Argentina. It's dangerously easy to fly to the wrong place. Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors. Phew. The airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks. Or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. Always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. 
It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears. For example, by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles, it's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. They'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. With 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button, it's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you, nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence. And while falling out, they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilot for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. 
Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and therefore aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use. But since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners, they won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one, don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh, I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movies. Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports, and carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% to more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry, all the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. If you have a long layover between flights, 
going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data, but if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time, but the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the U.S. Being a member of this program has some great perks. First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. 
If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt. And forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the US, then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky. What's up? Feeling anxious while landing? Hey, there's no need to worry, even if you land in such a particular place as Bhutan. Thing is, the terrain here is so extreme, it makes it super complicated to land. What's interesting about flying there is that there are really few pilots out there who are certified to land in Bhutan. Yeah, zigzagging toward the ground sounds like a real quest. Bhutan Paro International Airport is often named one of the world's most dangerous airports. In the whole world, there are only two airlines that fly to this airport. About 10 years ago, there were only eight pilots who were permitted to fly there. But today, the number is a bit bigger. But even so, there's something even tougher than Bhutan Paro International Airport. Seems like the Tenzing Hillary Airport in Lukla, Nepal has every possible danger. Short runway, super powerful winds, mountainous terrain, this place has it all. <laughs> the runway here is only 1,729 feet long. Just for comparison, a regular runway in most airports is about 10,000 feet long or even more. Now, many airports have carpets in their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks – low ceilings, comfortable seats, and a pleasant natural lighting. Needless to say that all those decorations cost airports a pretty penny. And carpets are not as easy to clean as hard floors are. But the key thing here is that they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them feel more relaxed. Well, sorry to break it to you, but it's not only meant to make you feel good. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7 to 10% more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty free zone. So, by investing in the passengers' comfort, airports are likely to increase their own income. Hey, as for spending money in the airport, there's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check in the golden hour. It's the time when passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Ah, let's admit it. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashing sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. You know how it sometimes goes? You get to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. Bye-bye, water bottle. Actually, you have an opportunity to mail them to any address inside the country. As for the unclaimed baggage, it's usually stored for about 60 days. Things taken away by security and not claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the screening passengers by observation technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior to detect suspicious people. Uh -oh. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they will talk to the person to try to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main terminals and passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? They then check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest clues in people's behavior. So, you arrive at the airport already anticipating a couple of weeks away from work and all your daily troubles, park your car in the lot, and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? 
Well, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody has to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab or have a friend drop you off. Contrails, those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes, are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets may turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the plane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew outside will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time to rescue the passengers and the flight crew. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. Woohoo! There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. They move in strange ways, but have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut fuel costs and make air travel even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air collide at very high speeds and it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes over mountain ranges and near jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, so it exits from the tail. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than to go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the plane on the outside. Anyway, if you're still nervous about flying, remember what pilots say. Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. Uh, that didn't help, did it? You're on an expedition through the swamplands of Florida. You run into some sinkholes. Oops, was that a crocodile? Watch out! Suddenly, you reach an asphalt road. It looks a lot like a runway, but there's no airport building around. You decide to inspect it, and a walk down the runway takes you a half an hour. At the end of it, you notice a trailer. There are four people inside. They tell you you've accidentally run into what was supposed to become the largest airport in the world, five times the size of JFK, to be more precise. Project Everglades Jetport was launched in 1968, right at the end of the golden age of air travel. It was supposed to become an intercontinental hub with six runways for supersonic jets carrying up to 300 passengers. 
They chose this location between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, far from large cities, because it would make it possible to fly both to South America and Europe in under three hours. At that time, the top speed for a commercial passenger plane was around 500 miles per hour. But that was about to change. Concorde was almost ready to make its first flight, and Boeing was also working on a huge lightning-fast passenger plane. So those super short flight times would be perfectly possible. And no one would mind the loud sounds of takeoff and landing over the ocean, unlike in the area around some inland airports. Passengers would travel to the new hub by high-speed rail, connecting it to surrounding cities on both the Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico. The terminal was supposed to be extremely luxurious, with many lounges for its future well-off passengers. But none of this ever came true. The construction of the airport began, but was finished right after they built the runway. First of all, residents and activists saw a report saying that the new airport would ruin the South Florida ecosystem and the Everglades National Park. So they were strongly against the construction. Second the Boeing supersonic passenger jet program was called off. In less than 20 years, while the tests for supersonic planes were running, the Federal Aviation Administration received 40,000 complaints about sonic booms from people living under the testing areas. Those sounds of shockwaves created by jets traveling faster than the speed of sound were breaking glass and scaring people and farm animals. So the airlines across the country knew supersonic flights wouldn't be a commercial success. And there was no more need for a huge airport to serve those planes. The finished runway was used for training pilots for years. It's long enough to land Boeing 747s and is in an isolated location. So it was perfect for those purposes. Then, as flight simulators became way more advanced and pilots didn't need to practice there anymore, the unfinished airport started serving general aviation aircraft. Even on its busiest days, it doesn't get more than a dozen takeoffs and landings a day. So the staff of four people works here from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. every day. Sometimes they use the airport for car races. On the other side of the world, what used to be an airport of prime importance is now a ground for picnics, festivals, and fashion shows. You can also go skateboarding and fly some kites on the runways of the former Tempelhof Airport in Berlin, Germany. It was the world's largest building until the Pentagon was finished. It was also the first airport in the world to have an underground railway. The site of the airport belonged to the Knights Templar in medieval times, and that's how it got its name. The 1920s were its prime time. Closer to the end of its service, mostly small commuter aircraft used the airport until it was shut down in 2008. Floyd Bennett Field in New York is now also living its new life as a ground for cycle races and stargazing with the Amateur Astronomers Association. It used to be New York's first municipal airport in the 1930s. American aviation pioneer Amelia Earhart used to land here. Then Newark Airport in New Jersey was growing in importance more and more, and Floyd Bennett Field was closed for good. One of the most beautiful stations of the New York subway with vaulted ceilings, arches, and emerald green tiling is sitting underground, abandoned. The very first subway line had the City Hall station as its southern terminal stop. Over 15,000 people were excited to take a ride when the subway was officially opened at the very beginning of the 20th century. The ride back then cost one nickel. The very first ride departed from that crown of the jewel City Hall station. Over the years, the subway trains became longer, and they could no longer stop and let passengers board safely because of the curved platforms. And that's how the station started losing its passengers. People got used to the subway to the point that they didn't care about its beauty, but mostly functionality. Plus, the City Hall station has always been off the express track, so passengers prefer to use the nearby Brooklyn Bridge station instead, which lets them travel much faster and also get off closer to the famous bridge. So the only way to visit the City Hall station today is to take part in a tour organized by the New York Transit Museum. No trains at all depart from the great abandoned train yard in Bolivia for at least 80 years. You'll find over 100 train cars not far from Uni. It used to be an important transportation hub for the region for a long time, 
because of its good location between major cities in Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. The hub played an important role in transporting minerals to the Pacific ports. By the middle of the 20th century, the mines had been exhausted of resources and shut down. The trains were left to rust in the salt flats. The beautiful steel trains turned into ruins in no time because of the salt winds that corroded the metal. Now the yard is a popular tourist destination. If you ever find yourself in Turkey, you might run into a Disney-style village standing empty and not finished. It cost the company in charge of the project around $200 million to build over 500 castles, around 200 fewer than they originally planned. The village of Burj al-Babas, surrounded by a magical forest, was supposed to have leisure centers, Turkish baths, some luxurious shops, and other entertainment for its inhabitants from all around the world. The people were happy to invest money in the future royal-like life, but then an economic crash hit the country. The buyers were worried about the future of the project and pulled out most of the funds. The construction company went bankrupt, and the fairy tale village stands abandoned ever since. In the middle of the 20th century, a man in the Turkish region of Cappadocia was renovating his house and then noticed that his chickens had started to disappear for good. He decided to solve the mystery, so he did some digging and found a dark passage going underground. It turned out to be one of 600 entrances other homeowners found leading to a whole abandoned underground city. It was large enough to fit around 20,000 people and had a complicated system of 18 levels. Archaeologists found that it wasn't just a bunch of tunnels in the dark, but had all the signs of civilization. There were schools, kitchens, dry food storage, cattle stables, and many dwellings down there. There was even a complex ventilation system and a protected well to provide air to breathe and fresh water for everyone. The city was first mentioned in writing in 370 BCE. It was most likely built as a shelter from natural disasters and enemies. Cappadocia was the perfect place to build a place like this because there's no water in the soil and the rocks are easily moldable. A lot of airports are built near water, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. First off, most airports are located in big cities, and big cities are usually built near some form of water anyway. Back in the day, before trucks and proper roads were built, goods were transported by ship. Having a river or ocean nearby was vital to deliver essential supplies to the cities, like food and building supplies. It also allowed for trading to boost the local economies. Because most people travel into big cities for business and holidays, rather than rural areas, it made sense to build the airports there. The high demand for travel meant that the airports were needed and also made them profitable. But that's not the only reason they're built near water. Big cities are usually super crowded, and airports require a lot of land. Imagine trying to find a space big enough in the middle of New York City to put an airport. It would be basically impossible. Areas next to water are usually a bit more rural, so there's more space than the big cities filled with skyscrapers. Some countries have even taken this one step further. Land is really scarce in Japan, so to build Kansai International Airport, the architects of Osaka headed three miles offshore to Osaka Bay to make a man-made island. The artificial island is 13,200 feet long and 8,500 feet wide. That's so big that it can even be seen from space. It took a whopping 38 months to complete, and travelers can get across to the main island of Honshu via car, railroad, or high-speed ferry. Kansai International Airport opened in 1994 and became the world's first airport to be built on the sea. Despite its location, it has the longest airport terminal in the world with a length of just under one mile. Airplanes also can't have any obstacles around them when landing. It would be really difficult to try landing a plane with obstructions. These include trees, mountains, buildings, and power lines. Over water, nothing will restrict planes from taking off or landing, making it much safer. On mountainous islands, runways are often parallel to the ocean, as the mountains are inland, just like in the Grand Canaria Airport located on one of the Canary Islands. It also links to safety reasons. If a plane has to cancel a runway landing and go back around again, there must be enough room for it to do this safely without hitting anything. 
It's also got to be able to climb back up into the air at a safe angle to avoid causing problems for the passengers inside. Reaching this safe altitude is much easier, quicker, and safer by the sea, compared to big cities or mountainous areas. Speaking of failed landings, pilots are trained to deal with engine failure on takeoff. If a plane reaches the right speed for takeoff, it has to leave the runway, even if the engine fails. But don't worry, planes can still fly with only one engine, it just requires a bit more effort. Because of the reduced capacity, it takes longer to reach the right altitude, and more space is required for takeoff. Taking off towards the ocean makes it easier to climb to a safe altitude without worrying about colliding with any obstacles. Another reason for airports being built at water level is that the higher up we go, the thinner the air becomes. It causes the thrust of the engines to decrease, as well as the lift produced by the wings. Setting off from higher areas means it's more difficult for the planes to take off. In terms of money, this would mean building longer runways, which would cost more, and no one wants that. This also means the planes require less fuel as they don't burn as much energy on takeoff. And there's less noise made as the planes don't have to work as hard. But despite this making the planes less noisy, airports are going to have pretty high noise levels. Imagine hearing planes zooming over your house while you're trying to get sleep at night. This is a key reason why airports are usually built on the coast far away from any residential areas, as fish aren't generally known to file noise complaints. In some countries, airports actually have to provide upgrades for nearby houses that will be affected by the noise. Germany is one of these countries, and they do everything from improving roofs to adding wall insulation to cover all that noise. Building by the coast means that they don't have to pay up for all these expensive upgrades, which saves the airport lots of cash. Coastal areas also have weather advantages for flying. Sea breezes are steady winds that blow from the water to the land. Planes mostly land and take off with the wind, making it the perfect place to build an airport as there'll be no delays caused by unexpected strong winds. But while the sea breezes that come in spring and summer are great, Areas near water can be prone to fog during fall and winter, so this part has its pros and cons. But not every airport is on the coast, as it does also pose a number of issues too. One of the biggest is birds. Our feathered friends love the coast because of all the yummy fish, but they can cause big problems for pilots. But airports manage to get around this using scare tactics. Birds don't really enjoy noise, and planes aren't the quietest of things. Airports also make loud bangs and even train hawks to take down birds that are in the way. The most obvious risk of building close to the sea, though, is flooding. Airports cost crazy amounts of money to build, and planes aren't cheap either. Back in 2018, Kansai Airport was flooded by Typhoon Jebi. They had to cancel all operations for two days, and the water was so high that it damaged the engines of the planes. While coastal airports put measures in place to protect against flooding, it's pretty difficult to save everything from a typhoon. With rising sea levels and an increase in extreme weather, these floodings are also looking more and more likely to happen. A quarter of the world's 100 busiest airports are less than 32 feet above sea level, and 12 of those, including New York, San Francisco, and Shanghai, are less than 16 feet. Yikes! All that water poses another problem. If planes overshoot the runway, they have nowhere to go. Overshooting is basically when the pilot underestimates the length of the runway and doesn't reach takeoff speed in time. There are usually extra bits of concrete or grass that the plane can run onto when the airports are on land. There'd be a bit of damage to the plane in this case, but nothing major. But with coastal airports, the plane might go straight into the water. Luckily, there's new tech that aims to prevent this from happening. These new kits let the pilots enter in all the flight calculations, including the weather conditions that could affect takeoff. This system then calculates how much runway the plane will need to stop. Many airports also have added soft concrete to the end of runways to avoid a watery disaster. When the plane glides onto this soft concrete, they get stuck and it stops them traveling too far. There are also financial issues with building airports next to the water. Land rent next to the coast or lakes is usually higher than the mainland due to the demand. Like 40% of the US population lives on the coast, despite coastal areas only making up around 10% of America's total landmass. Airports require flat land to be built on, 
but this isn't always easy to find, and coastal land can pose particular problems due to sand conditions on marshland. But this doesn't mean it's not possible. One of the world's most famous airports, New York's JFK, was built on marshland. The land was a lot cheaper than usual, and marshland can't really be used for a lot. Of course, it can cost a lot of money to make the ground suitable to carry heavy loads, but this was all sorted. Finding such a big area close to one of the world's most famous cities was a very rare find, even if it was marshland. <laughs>